Hi Ransico, your friendly neighborhood elf. I know you've missed me. In today's video, we're going to talk about books that deserve coal and only coal. Without further ado, because we elves have a lot of things in our plate, let's just talk about those naughty, naughty books. The first book that I'm going to talk about is the book that I incidentally started my year with and I hate it with a fiery passion of an especially angry dragon. Brits and the Assassin by Tavia Lark is an example of good marketing but terrible production. Uh, this is a fantasy romance MM story that absolutely and undeniably needed more editing and honestly more time from the order. If you go to my first fanfic tag on AO3, you will encounter better works than this one. The story has a really good hook and the premise is fascinating. It's about an assassin named Whisper that has to integrate himself into the court and kill Prince Julian. He has to pose as his guardian and then kill him at an opportune moment, but the plans are mixed up because Whisper falls for Julian. It's a solid premise. It's something that you can build a very cool fantasy or romance story on. This, though, wasn't a good romance and wasn't a good fantasy. The characters are paper thin, they don't have any secondary motivations, they don't have personality, and uh, they are hardly people. They are written to be convenient uh, for the storyline and to fit into audiences' expectations for specific tropes. Fitting audiences' expectations is not always a bad thing, but when it feels like these characters are underdeveloped, undercooked, and there is no actual internal motivation for them to do the things that the Order is making them do, it doesn't read like a good novel. They also don't have any chemistry, and every opportunity that the Order had to explore their intimacy and explore in depth their chemistry she decided to pass. Uh, the sexual element of the story is the only element that makes uh, this a romance an adult romance. Otherwise, the characters don't read as adults, they read as teenagers. This is a romance story first and foremost. Uh, the fantasy elements are the secondary background elements, but because the romance wasn't that good, I had to try and find something valuable for myself uh, in the world building, and the world building was very basic. The Order doesn't really understand the geography and the politics of her own world. She fares a little bit better on the magic side of things, but the magic is very simplistic, so... It's not really high praise. I personally like the idea of this book much more than the execution of it. And sometimes people are in the Lulu land. And I think if they have a great idea, it makes them into a great order. A good order can spin a very basic idea into a phenomenal novel. And the main problem that I have with Prince and the Assassin is that it feels like the story was rushed to be self-published, that an appropriate time was not spent on developing these characters in this world. It does feel like a cash grab type of book with really good marketing. Let's move on to young adult thrillers, Five Total Strangers by Natalie D. Richards. I believe a pretty popular pick on a small and humble human social media called TikTok. This is a snowy thriller about a teen girl named Mira who is going back home to support her mom during the holidays because of some tragedies in the family. She's expecting her plane in the airport, but it gets cancelled because of a horrible snowstorm and she has to figure out a way to come back home before the holidays because she is is extremely and overtly responsible for adults in her life. In the airport she meets a bunch of kids that are planning to rent a car and to uh, travel in the same direction, so she joins them. And after some time on the road, they start noticing that someone is following them. The second point of view in this book is the point of view of a stalker that actually follows 
Mira specifically. The mystery of the story is who the identity of the stalker is. It's a great premise. I love a snowstorm uh, thriller because we don't have any other weather in the North Pole. But the execution lacked a few very important elements to make this thriller enjoyable. First of all, a lot of things were said about the scary atmosphere of the story in the story itself, but not a lot of scary things were shown. And the author had a lot of opportunities to do it. After all, a snowstorm is a life and death situation, and the characters could have been a bit more worried about that. The characters themselves are quite bland. If you pick any troubled teen uh, series on Netflix, you will see the same archetypes. Nothing new was offered. Now, a basic thriller can do very well for itself if it actually is scary or is genuinely mysterious, but it was pretty obvious who the stalker is. The reveal at the end feels very unsatisfactory because it's not a great twist. There were two other options in the story that could have been a better choice, so the mystery element is very lazy. Not to speak of the improbability of them all ending in the same car, Mira Stalker had to figure out a way to make the snowstorm happen so they would be able to convince Mira to rent a car and go on this road trip with a bunch of strangers. And we don't get to see any planning from the stalker's part in the story. So too many things had to actually come together for the story to work. And it doesn't seem like the stalker did any work for it to happen. The next book is also a winter thriller, but it's a survival thriller. I'm Still Alive by Alice Marshall. I've read a lot of reviews praising this book, but I genuinely don't understand what part was enjoyable about it. The story is about Jess, who loses her mother in an accident and who is forced by the government to reunite with her father and live with him. Her father never felt comfortable in a large human cluster societies. So when Jess was little, he left the family to live in the wilderness. He is one of those survivalists, on my own with nature type of guys. And she already a teenager doesn't really remember him. So when they meet up, she doesn't feel many warm feelings toward him. It turns out that her father was a part of some extremist group that doesn't let him leave his life. He left it a long time ago. The extremist group attacks her father and kills him and Jess has to survive on her own and figure out how to get back home to her stepfather. The problem with the story is I don't understand what's the point of it. You would think that it's a story about a child and an absent father that reunite and build a connection when they're older. But it's actually not that, because compared to all the things that happen in the story, they spend a minuscule amount of time together. You would think that it's a story where where the protagonist uh, does a lot of self-growth and rethinks some of the choices in her life, some of the connections that she has with other people. But despite her spending a lot of time on her own, surviving, she isn't doing much thinking outside of figuring out how to build fire and where to find food. You would think this is just a thriller then, and it's about Jess that uh, happened to become a part of something bigger and happened to stumble upon bad guys and has to survive them. In a way, it is this type of story, but at the same time, it's not action-packed enough to be an enjoyable thriller. So at the end, when I finished the story, I realized that I just don't understand what the story is trying to tell me, what the story is trying to achieve. Let's move on to romances. As you know, we elves 
love romances we love love but still despite the overall open-mindedness of else we still encounter some bad bad romances that do deserve some good good cool the first book that i'm going to talk about is suddenly you by lisa klepas it's a historic glamour romance and it has a really fun premise but once again really annoying execution it follows a woman in her 30s named amanda who's a very successful order but who is a spinster she has not done any work in her romantic life because she looked after her aging parents she's bogged down by this so she takes everything in her own hands and goes to a public house to order someone that can help with her problem the lady that owns the public house tells amanda that she's going to pick a perfect man for her and the only thing that she has to do is expect him at her place at a specific time the specific time comes and amanda is introduced to jack jack that actually is not the worker of the public house but is a publisher that bought amanda's first work and wants to work on it with her but he plays along and pretends to be the guy that Amanda expected. They fool around a little bit, they have a lot of romantically and sexually charged conversations, but eventually, despite them having a lot of chemistry, Jack has to come out with it and tell Amanda the truth that he was not the guy that she hired. They build a flirtatious relationship and they spend a lot of time with each other because they have to work together and eventually their relationship develops into something more. The thing that I didn't like about the story is that Amanda, despite being a very young woman, she's only in her 30s, reads like someone 50 plus. She reads like a very old woman. Uh, she has a lot of insecurities about her body and her looks and uh, she spends a lot of time thinking about it and it's not personally my favorite type of female character. I think at Thor you have to build some kind of an acceptance around the way you look. After all, you've spent 30 years looking into mirrors. Amanda is so deeply insecure that she doesn't believe that Jack is genuinely attracted to her despite having evidence in front of her eyes and Jack is extremely pushy and possessive. If it would have worked better for me if Jack's interest in Amanda was sincere, as in it's very clear from his point of view that he only wants to use her for her body and is not intending anything serious. The time in history where that kind of attention from a man could completely ruin her reputation. Amanda also experiences the brunt of the consequences from engaging with a man that is not her husband and is not planning to be her husband by becoming pregnant. The pregnancy isn't planned and she doesn't want Jack to be with her out of responsibility, which is just an extension of her insecurity. He made a baby with her. He was an active participant of the act and he should bear the same responsibilities. Because he's not serious about her, somehow it makes him exempt from taking on the responsibilities for his own child. After a few unpleasant conversations, Jack decides to take on the responsibility and to raise this baby together with Amanda. In that relationship, he becomes extremely possessive. And I just don't see it as romantic. Basically, it's a couple that was baby trapped. They are together only because of this child. Neither Amanda or Jack wanted this baby and they decided to be together to raise it because they couldn't do anything else in the circumstances. And the fact that Lisa Klepas was trying to gaslight me into believing that a couple that was together because of an unfortunate circumstance could develop feelings for each other and that it was an absolutely normal foundation for a family was frankly insulting. But to add soul to the wound, Amanda loses the baby in the epilogue. In the epilogue. It was absolutely unnecessary to make this woman suffer even more 
because it was the epilogue, we were past the actual conflict of the story. It just felt entirely sadistic on Lisa Clipas's part. The last book that we're going to talk about is The Fiance Farce by Alexander Belafleur, the order that I have not expected to ever put on this kind of list. This is an FF contemporary romance and it's a big mess. This romance has no place being this long. The story follows Tansy, who is a shy librarian uh, with a father that recently passed. Her stepmom wants to sell all her father's businesses, including a bookshop that Tansy loves and that she runs. She doesn't have the money to buy the bookshop uh, from her stepmom and she doesn't know what to do. She also is not very lucky on the romantic front and her relatives and friends make fun of her because she doesn't have a significant other. And because of that, she makes up a significant other. Uh, she is a big lover of romance novels and she decides to tell everyone that the model on one of the romance covers is her girlfriend. It's bonkers. Either way, she actually meets the model at her step uh, sister's uh, wedding party, and the model turns out to be the cousin of the groom. Her name is Gemma. So Gemma and Tansi on the spot decide to pretend that they are together, and this lie is something that they keep on keeping on because Gemma, it turns out, also needs a wife to claim her inheritance, which is bonkers on top of bonkers on top of bonkers and the order continues to bring on more and more ridiculous subplots and ridiculous tropes that do not help the believability of the novel. Both Tansi and Gemma are cliché characters. Gemma is a playboy type of character with a long history of broken-hearted lovers and Tansy is her opposite. She's a shy librarian with a spicy secret side, the spicy secret side being her loving vintage underwear. And somehow, somehow, they are very attracted to each other to the point of them literally switching personalities, not with each other, but generally changing their personalities overnight. Gemma changes like that. She's so obsessed with Tansy and she wants to bang her so hard. She decides that she's no longer a player. She's not it. Despite having a childhood friend with whom she uh, had a fling with, with whom she had a sexual relationship with, and whom she's been stringing along for years and years. Somehow, during those years, she was not doing any self-reflection. But the moment Tansy came along, self-reflection abound. She is no longer the person that she was. The story was undercooked, it was cliche, and somehow it was also so long and tedious. I have not believed in any of the things that happened, and the romance itself was very shallow and it remained shallow till the very end of the story. I did not love it, I did not even like it, and I do not recommend to start with Alexander Belafleur's work, with this novel. She has other stuff that is much, much better. This is it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you reached this part of the video, leave a snowflake emoji and a book that I really didn't like th this year uh, in the comments down below. And on this note, I will see you soon with another video. But until then, 